and uh, I will now call upon the reflection group to give us the reactions to what we've said and to the proposals. Uh, Professors, I will leave it up to you to decide in which order you are going to intervene. I will simply say, please, no more than five minutes, each of you. And I've got a clock in front of me, and I intend to apply it. Okay? Thank you. You can talk. There's a microphone on, your, on the table, and you can use it. Working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whoever, uh, please introduce yourself. It's better than I, if I do it. Susanna, you do it. You introduce yourself. So okay. my name is Susanna Caffaro. I am professor at Università del Salento in Italy, where I have a chair, a Jean Monnet chair on supranational democracy in European Union law. First of all, let me thank you, all, all of you, because uh, your contributions are precious not only in a discussion about national democracies but also on any kind of real and futuristic <laughs> democracy, I mean, transnational, supranational, international. Most of the issues are nowadays above and beyond the states. So I think we need more and more of citizens' engagement at all levels, not just at national level. I have just a little, a little uh, comment on the, on the report I would like to add another part, or suggest to add another part on information, not on misinformation, but really on information, because I think we often lack information, especially on civic engagement. Let me offer a little example. We had last year the conference on the future of Europe. We had four citizens' panels of 200 people randomly selected. One third was under 25, so very representative also of the new generations, and uh, we had also an online uh, uh, platform. And uh, these two, uh, two distinct tracks collected about uh, 300 proposals for the revision of the European politics. I wonder how many citizens know about that? And uh, what is interesting is that uh, on uh, September 14, uh, the President von der Leyen uh, pointed out in, his, uh, in, uh, in its uh, statement of the state of the, on the State of the Union that these panels of citizens, which are your assemblies of citizens, are going to become a normal tool for European legislation on some topics. So what you're uh, envisaging is already becoming reality. Once again, I wonder how many citizens know. So as we are here, uh, ho host hosted by the Athens Democracy Forum in association with the New York Times, I really would like to see more information, not just more avoiding of misinformation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Niki Foros Diamanduros. Long name, it's up there so you know what I am. Um, I want to thank um, Anthony and uh, Achilles for the invitation. I think this is very much of a worthwhile exercise that's posing central questions, but at the same time I think it, it is very challenging because it calls upon us to try and think on another level. Let me be specific. I retain from Anthony's introductory comments his passing reference to the importance of conceptual aspects of democracy. Uh, and this is something that needs to be, I think, brought in into our own discussions. Let me be very specific. One of the recommendations that came out was, should the Citizens' Assembly's recommendations be obligatory or not? Uh, at the conceptual level, if you're talking about liberal democracy, liberal representative democracy, you cannot go obligatory. Uh, I'm sorry I'm being professorial here, but I think the big issue here is if you take away the option of your representative to be able to decide on his or her options, 
by making it obligatory, then you're denuding the notion of democracy of its representative function. So it's a dilemma. I am not, I don't want to be understood as telling you what can and cannot be done, but I'm telling you the rich exchange of views here is posing dilemmas, and that's exactly what this whole exercise is, to in fact address dilemmas. Second point, uh, citizens' assemblies. I am very much in line with what was said a minute ago. Uh, this whole uh, movement is, has its roots, and I wish to emphasize that, in the Treaty of Lisbon. The Treaty of Lisbon introduced for the first time the idea of referenda, the, the idea of going to citizens, and therefore the challenge again before us is how do we expand that? How do we make it more applicable uh, at a wider level? Now here comes the catch again and another dilemma. Now, so my five minutes are, are, are designed to put dilemmas before you. Okay. So here's the other dilemma. Very much in favor of the idea of bringing things down to the local level. Uh, in Government 101, forget I'm an academic, in Government 101, we learned that one of the functions of parties is that they manage to bring together disparate interests and aggregate interests. If you bring things, everything down to the local level, how do you aggregate? Again, I'm not challenging, I'm putting the dilemmas in front of us so we can, in fact, deliberate about, um, um, among ourselves together creatively. Last point, um, again, uh, Anthony's, uh, one of, of Anthony's central points, which for me is extraordinarily important, is the, the realization of one of the, of the central dilemmas and central problems in to democracy today is lack of trust. So the issue of trust, how do you build trust? How do you address alienation Not, uh, in this, uh, 21st century um, gathering, it's nice to have a reflection back to one of the central findings of a, an unknown sociologist called Karl Marx. Uh, so, um, yes, trust. And how do you build trust and how do you address distrust? And I'll be very specific here again and I will conclude with that. One of of the striking uh, conclusions that I heard was that the citizens' panels expressed an interest in distrust in technology. Barked in the early 20, 19th century, it shows my age, um, in the early 19th century, there was a movement in, in, in the United Kingdom which was, which was in fact driven by the desire to destroy machinery which was in fact endangering jobs, you know, in the cottage industry and all that. So in other words, here you have another dilemma. Uh, the distrust of technology has to be coupled, and, the, and the, the, the youth panel said that, by education. You need to bring education in, in trying to repackage, reorient uh, the whole thrust of the understanding of democracy and I conclude with this because I'm mindful of the time. Let's be very clear here, and this was part of the presentation, but it has to be a central part of the presentation. We're not talking about democracy. We're talking about liberal democracy. The liberal democracy is not only rule of law and human rights, it is, if I may so say, also basically free and fair elections. So you need to have the three parts, elections, rule of law, and human rights, to speak about the type of democracy that this panel and this initiative and you know, this foundation is trying to promote. Not any type of democracy, and there are many types of democracies. Okay, electoral democracy being one of them, which of course can become a travesty. So uh, I want to conclude with that simply, uh, oh, one last point, local yes. How about the supranational? Don't we want to give any thought about the idea how democracy can insinuate itself into something called the European Union? 
which in fact is pretty much a democracy without the full underpinning of everything. And I think it should not be forgotten or done away with. It's another important dimension, particularly in this area. Thank you very much. I'm George Pagulatos. <clears throat> I'll start with a sobering point and an optimistic point. The sobering point is that we have not heard something that we have never heard before. Uh, but it is impossible to hear something that has not been stated or written before. There have been millions of pages written on these things. The optimistic point is that it is very important that we have renewed attention to these very significant, very vital issues for our democracies and our well-being. Uh, the renewed attention and the, the renewed discussion and deliberation is what makes a difference and what leads to more active citizens. Now, I will make a, a prescriptum uh, in my point, and part of it picks up on where Nikiforos left, because this is a discussion about the resilience of democracy. The resilience of democracy vis-a-vis -vis political demagogues, vis-a-vis -vis misinformation and disinformation, vis-a-vis -vis the manipulation or indifference of citizens, and also vis-a-vis -vis crises. And we have been seeing crises in democracies, and democracies are receding in the world. Democracies are not winning around the globe over the last 10 years, 15 years. Uh, and one of the main, the, of the key tests for democracies is their ability to handle crises, especially crises that are exogenous. Uh, and most of the crises that we have seen in Europe, for example, since 2008, when the global financial crisis started, and then a whole avalanche of, of other crises ensued was that they were exogenous and they very much had to do with the ability of governments to coordinate, the ability of governments to delegate authorities and competence to the supranational level, the European Union, but also a rule-based multilateral order. And we should not forget that because we need a, a functioning rule-based multilateral system. But they also have to do with the ability of governments to deliver. So I would say the first test of the resilience of democracies is the competence of governments. And of course, this does not have to do only with the executive. It also has to do with the other branches. And I've, I've very happily heard the proposal on the introduction of the fourth branch of government. It is important to keep in mind that citizens' assemblies are there to support legislative and parliamentary institutions and not to substitute for them. Uh, I, I had the, the privilege of being Greece's uh, citizens' representative for the European Conference uh, on the Future of Europe. And um, the experience there was very important, but part of the importance was how citizens came together with elected parliamentarians and politicians to deliberate on practical challenges and realistic solutions. And the proposal, therefore, to bring together civic representatives with experts is uh, something that we should uh, start from. The importance of political parties. It cannot be easily overstated. Political stability and democratic stability rests on strong national political parties. If one looks at how and why Trump rose in the United States, a lot of it, not the whole picture, but a lot of it has to do with the weakness of the political parties. Contrast that to the stability of the party system and democracy in countries like Germany, where political parties have a strong uh, tradition in terms of organization and in terms of resources. But of course, contrast that to the demise of the party system in Italy after the 80s. Strong political parties which, however, were not sufficiently accountable and transparent. So we need the combination of strong political party systems, but also accountability, transparency, uh, checks and balances, all the guarantees that uh, the rule of law in liberal democracies um, offer. Um, important thing, parties also need to compete for the attention of citizens. And the greatest challenge of democracies is how you can mobilize the interest of citizens and bring them together to become active citizens. And this is very difficult to do in prosperous societies. It is even more difficult to do in 
societies that are on the path of development where citizens are facing real challenges of subsistence on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's also very difficult to do at a time of misinformation and disinformation. Because what we have been witnessing over the last couple of decades, at least, is that the null hypothesis of liberalism, upon which our liberal democracies and our pluralistic systems have been built over the last couple of centuries at least, that if you allow all the views and the narratives to be aired freely, truth will emerge, truth will shine, this has not held. And it will not come as a shock to you that truth has not prevailed. And hence, we are discussing about fake news, we're discussing about how to govern the public sphere of disinformation and rule upon the ability of platforms and the ability of malign uh, actors to bring about campaigns of disinformation. One proposal I would add to the very important proposals that have been made is that the algorithms should be in the public domain and should be subject to public regulation. Whether uh, platforms lead you to other uh, news and how they operate and, and they generate uh, feeds in your, um, uh, you can clearly see my technical uh, skills there have been exhausted in describing what I want to describe, but I think you understand what I mean. The algorithm should be under public regulatory uh, control. Uh, and a, a, final, a final point, um, and I very much agree with the point that Nikiforos made. It is important to strengthen local politics, local communities, yes, because that is the point where public policy meets societal needs and societal responses. After all, the notion of subsidiarity uh, is premised upon this understanding, but it is also important to keep in mind that the sphere of pluralism and the checks and balances of pluralistic democracy and the countervailing forces operate at a higher level. In other words, uh, lowering politics at the local level has advantages but has a very important risk that it can render politics subject to the collusion of local interests without the oversight mechanisms and without the countervailing power that democracies offer at the higher national, let alone supranational European level. So it is important to keep this balance between the local, the communal, and the national in order to have democracies that are thriving in terms of liberal democracies that are rule-based, that operate in rule of law, and societies and communities that are responsive and based upon active citizens. So thank you again for the opportunity uh, you are giving us uh, to reflect on these very important issues for our democracies. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm Panagiotis Dodonis from the University of Oxford. And I would like to say that the very idea that democracy is based on building blocks is really illuminating and useful. I have to tell you that one of the first references to the collective decision making, though not in a democratic state, is that by Herodotus, who said that ancient Persians decided twice, once drunk and once sober. The very same has been said by Tacitus regarding the ancient Germans. Why drunk and why sober in assemblies? Because drunk means the heated debate. It means also the engagement that is needed in order for the people who decide to, to, to be part of the whole process and to be one team. And sober, of course, in order to, for someone to take the responsibility for the decision that has been taken. And I think that this is a key notion, the notion of responsibility. Which are the problems that we are facing right now regarding the building blocks of democracy? Which are those powers that want to disempower democracy? So the so-called, we should name them, the so-called illiberal democracies. I could name them, but I would like not to. Distrust in mass media, citizen disengagement, and of course, fake news and all these algorithms that have been used by powers and forces and countries that directly attack democracy. So what is the solution? I think that more or less there is a very clear 
tide of thought that says that direct democracy may be the solution. And to tell you the truth, I don't agree. Why? Because the, 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 the very center of the, of the discussion, as I said, is the concept of responsibility. This is why decisions should be taken for the second time sober. And direct democracy goes against the concept of responsibility. There is no one to blame, no one to credit for these decisions. And citizen assemblies, in my view, if we mean selection by lot, for example, there is a very big discussion in constitutional theory regarding whether selection by lot is direct or representative democracy, but I think, I think that it's direct democracy because it's actually a way to, to, to avoid the problem of you know, many people coming together in a very same place, an assembly, an ecclesia, and also for the ancient Athenians who did not know the concept of representation, election by lot in the ancient, ancient Boulet, for example, was a, a, an institution of direct democracy. So citizens' assemblies, first of all, we don't know who these people would be, and also we can be pretty sure that they could not be responsible for the decisions taken. So Nikiforos very wisely pointed out that we are speaking about liberal democracy. I would like to add that we are speaking about liberal, constitutional, and representative democracy. And in order for the citizen disengagement to stop, which is the problem at the end of the day, we need to show that the system actually works. And how does the system of representative, liberal, constitutional democracy work? Through checks and balances and through institutional counterweights. This means that the constitution should be a limit to uh, decisions taken by the democratic majority, but without taking into consideration rights or the way the state is organized. And this also means that there should be breaks towards a, a very big assumption of power by people who do not believe in the institution. So the final thing is, and the final question is, how do we, whether do we have, whether we have adequate institutional counterweights against, first, majorities who actually, of people who do not respect rights, and secondly, against uh, majorities which actually want to break the rules of the organization of the polity. So we need actually people who believe in the very idea of political coexistence, which in my view is the cornerstone of representative democracy. Many thanks. Well, I will open now the floor to questions and discussions. Um, may I please ask, uh, if you've got a question, make it short. If you've got a point to make, um, please also make it short. Um, the reflection group was kind enough to give us an extra six minutes, but I would like to allow as many of you as possible to uh, ask questions and to intervene. I can see the hand there, just one second. Give me one second, Carolina, as well. Um, I just want to respond to, to a couple of the points um, that were raised by the reflection group. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm sort of exploiting my position as being here. But uh, um, Nikifor, you said it cannot be obligatory. Well, if democracy comes down to the local level and it is the, really the people's uh, will to do so, why shouldn't that be obligatory? Or at least, uh, why not shouldn't the go to the other side uh, as a sort of solution between the two sides, between obligatory and advisory, have the government obliged to explain why it does not follow the, uh, the uh, suggestion or the, okay, that's the one point. 
in terms of uh, what George said, uh, Pagulatos, about uh, local and national, um, I think that the intention of bringing democracy to the local level was not for the local level to decide for things that concern the national level. It is bring local democracy for the local level. Have, in other words, the communities decide what they want for themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, sort of solves, answers part of your, uh, part of your point. And um, one thing that I would like to mention in terms of the uh, youth hack, uh, the role of education. Well, this is exactly one of the things that we, want, that we did bring up. Uh, and uh, we mentioned it very specifically in terms of uh, uh, digitalization. Uh, and it's very, very clear. And actually, it's been one of the recommendations that we've made in a previous um, project that we carried out, which was called Democracy Catching Up with Technology, where we said, uh, that it is absolutely important today for the government to educate people, not only generally as a better education, but also in terms of the digital revolution. Otherwise, you do risk, uh, you do have a very great risk of ha having a new social divide. And that social divide is also going to lead to a political divide and to an economic divide. Okay, I'm stopping here and um, uh, I think there is, Karina Alami, there were two hands at the, at the middle there, at, and um, Karina, I'll come back to you right after this. And to the extent possible, if you have a specific question about one of the specific proposals that was presented by our group of curators here, feel free to address your question directly to them, or a more general question, and then we'll see who's most appropriate to make yeah. a stab at answering it. Yeah. We have the microphone. Can I proceed, sir? Should I proceed? Yes, go ahead, okay. please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Basitana Danji. I'm from South Africa, the Northwest Provincial Legislature. Firstly, I would like to really welcome and appreciate uh, the presentations. It's very empowering to some of us. As some of us, our democracy is still at a developmental state. But one interesting matter that I want to, to talk to, and I'll be very short, trust me, Chair, is on the, one of the recommendations that uh, political donations and fundraising should be limited to contributions that uh, are from individuals living in the particular area. I'm not sure how are we going to regulate that I'm not uh, maybe in favor of that proposal because at the same time, it's very limiting. You'll understand that uh, most of the contributors of these donations are business people. And the business people as a sector, they do their business everywhere. I might be from South Africa, I might be from wherever, but doing business somewhere. What does this from where you come from mean in terms of uh, if you want to restrict uh, if the, proposal, the proposal's intention is to restrict those kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, businesses, because also as government, we have the responsibility to support democracy. Because sometimes, as much as we want to correct, we must not kill political parties. We must also be seen as supporting political parties. The last one, it's in terms of uh, uh, the, before that one. The other thing in that one is that uh, our funding model between government and political parties might not be the same from one country to the other. Maybe from South Africa it might be something different in terms of how do we support democracy in funding political parties as, as governments is very important so that as we agree in this kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a recommendation, we are very sure that uh, we have covered uh, uh, the other space. The second one is the, there was a proposal there in terms of reducing power of the executive. And I fully agree that uh, maybe the legislatures are not that strong. But uh, if we are honest to ourselves, the, the, the main reason for legislatures not to be strong as such, one is the issue of capacity. Legislatures are responsible for making laws. They need to be more capacitated 
so that uh, they are able to do what they have to do in holding the executive accountable. Because most of the executives, they have more money than the legislatures. In terms of our system, the legislature might be the one that uh, appropriate money for the executive, but the fact of the matter remains, the money comes from the executive. The legislatures will only get a little cent from that. So how do you reduce that power from a heavily funded executive with little resources as the legislatures somehow uh, very difficult of which I really support uh, the recommendation that indeed we must find a way to reduce that power, but we must also deal in terms of the funding part of it. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, Luca has a few remarks that you'd like to make. Thank you. The, the, the question about the uh, limit to the, or rather the, yes, we talk about a limit to only individuals in electorates uh, being given the, um, the right to contribute to political parties. So in terms of donations, I, I mean, it's, it, these are sort of questions which, of course, this, this, this forum here is not necessarily the best arrangement to sort of discuss the details of this. We didn't, but, but the recommendation that was made in particular in Australia and Sydney was to also cap cap it. So in fact, you know, what's the cap? So there is a, uh, a, a, an advocate, an ex-parliamentarian in Australia who is very enthusiastic about this whole question of donations and reforming donations. And he talks about a $200 cap. So in Australian dollars, that's what, 150 US, something like that. So it's not a lot of money. So the question of whether businesses will um, <clears throat> influence political parties, well, that's, that's always going to be a risk, but, but we're actually talking about, and, and, re and the reference here is specifically to the case of just individuals. So it's not people, it's not businesses, only individuals in the particular electorates can, can actually fund um, uh, uh, political parties. Yeah, thank you. Carolina? Hello, um, Carolina Vigura. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful panel, and uh, also I feel very honoured to be able to have been able to contribute a little bit to to the building blocks. Whilst I was listening to what you have been saying, I have been thinking that two notions basically were crucial. The first notion being process, democracy as a process. The second notion being. Uh, being resilience. And I have been thinking about the law of entropy as defined by Schrödinger, who basically claimed that entropy is a fate that every physical being has to suffer. So a stone which is in the air, which is, uh, which is left in the air, will just uh, um, dissolve. In a, a, a drop of ink will dissolve in water, etc., etc. But there is a kind of physical beings that is capable of resisting entropy. And those are living things. Now, when you think about democracy, it's a little bit similar. Democracy is a system which is created by humans, ergo living things, which is capable of resisting. And so, basically, the life of democracy, the process of democracy, is basically about resisting entropy. And when resilience is being discussed by experts on democracy, they basically say, say there are two kinds of resilience, democratic resilience. One is the onset resilience. This is the healthy organism. Everything is fine. The institutions are working, the checks and balances are working, everything's fine. But there is also a, another kind of resilience, uh, which is the breakdown resilience. The breakdown resilience is when democracy is already affected by authoritarian episodes, just like my democracy, Poland, or just like another European democracy, Hungary. Then, if we make uh, statements, if we make recommendations uh, which are how to make resilience stronger, 
we may feel trapped because we make recommendations for a healthy organism, but the, the organism is actually sick. So I would like to ask all of you, basically whoever would like to answer this, as for the recommendations that you have mentioned for the fields that you have been working on and the, the roundtables have been working on, how would you, uh, which recommendations would you say would be most relevant for those countries that are already affected by authoritarian episodes, but still there are dem democracies, only they have a lot of flaws and they are uh, under a lot of tension from the politica politicians who are, um, who are um, having these authoritarian tendencies. Thank you so much. We'd like to tackle that one. Anybody? I think it's a complex question, and I think it, uh, it brings up maybe the biggest difficulty in what we're doing here. Because I think when we're talking about democracy and public participation, here we're still addressing a world that has changed. Because you're talking about authoritarian regimes or politicians that are using the very fundamental tools of democracy to change the way the democracy works and to bring it to a, to a different scale. And I, I think the answers are not found here because we're still talking about things that, that maybe could have helped a few years ago. And I think just like the youth hack uh, um, said, this calls for a, a thinking out of the box. And a democracy has the right to defend itself and use the same tools that are used against it. So I think in, in a sense, um, the tools that are needed here are, um, you were talking about misinformation and labeling. I, I think where I come from, the people who are reading the misinformation know it's misinformation and they like it. So labeling won't do any, any good. Um, I think the other thing or the opposing idea would be to tackle, um, to tackle those tools with the same but the opposite kind of thinking um, tools. So we're not talking about public participation now in places uh, like Hungary or um, uh, I, I think, or places such uh, with such shift in, within the democracy, but I, I think the thought should be around using uh, the same tools to defend the democracy rather than try to re-educate that's it. Yeah. That's my optimistic view. Does anyone else from the group here want to comment on that? Yeah. Nobody? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for, um, for, for the statement right now. I think um, there is a certain conundrum in representative democracy itself that we always and, and what Amir said was was very uh, was 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 um, yeah very good statement about that when he said we're talking about something that is in the past. I think our perception of representative democracy was always that by representation, ideally, the best ideas and the best people emerge. But we're clearly facing um, a world where where that is not the case. One could even ask if that ever has been the case. Um, um, and uh, we have to acknowledge that without saying any, any names or countries or parties, where I think that's not fair on, on, on a global panel like this, but, but what do we do with, with a people that elects a government, more or less free and fair, that does not adhere to the rule of law and to democracy, and then continues to have that support or even increases that support? By being, represent, by, by being representative, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a conundrum. And, and to be honest, I, 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 would, I would very much overstep my expertise to, to, to say that I can offer a solution for that. I, I recently came across a kind of figure which, which intrigued me was, was to say, um, I, I can't quote the, the, the name anymore, but saying that there's a theory of communication to, to speak in, in long cycles of, of how communication develops. So you have speech, you have, um, uh, you have signs, you have printing, and now you have digitalization. And if you imagine the time frame that encompasses, we're talking about hundreds of years, um, thousands of years even, um, and applied it to democracy, one could make that point that we're 
in our short perception of lifespan, we're still very much at the beginning of how democracy evolves. And we're right now at, at one of the first big stepping stones. And that is to realize that we ourselves can shape reality. That is what people like Donald Trump did. They, they created reality by, by, by just shaping it out of thin air. And I think that is something that we did not imagine to happen in, in our ideal of representative democracy. And, and there were lots of points which were, which were already said here, which, which I think can counter that in, 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 in smaller ways. Um, um, certainly education is one. I think capacitating legis legislators, the legislative and, and independent from an executive is another. Um, but I think we have to be aware that, that this is a major stepping stone, probably not, yeah, probably not being over in a, in a few years. Just a very short comment. Um, I think that, um, Carolina, the issue that you raised is really how you deal with liberal, illiberal democracies, because this is what is happening in Hungary, and I believe to a certain extent in Poland. And I think that this is probably the most complex and difficult issue to deal with. And I must say that um, uh, this discussion is guilty um, of implicitly thinking how to strengthen democracy or liberal democracy with all the additional uh, sort of um, adjectives that Nikki Forrest and uh, Panos added and which are very much to the point. Uh, how to strengthen this kind of democracy. Uh, in other words, we're looking a little bit uh, at uh, what we're doing in the countries where democracy does exist, because this is where democracy is at its greatest danger. Look at what's happening in the States. Um, if democracy falls in the States, then I don't know what the result is going to be. And uh, I think that implicitly we're guilty of looking really at strengthening or making democracy more resilient where it, it's actually a liberal democracy. That's all. Colom, I think you had your hand up and you wanted to. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Colom. I co-founded a pan-European political party and a global grassroots movement, and we worked a lot on democracy. And I work with tens of thousands of people across the world, and I understand that putting together such consultations is very difficult. But to be honest, none of the proposals are relevant to my life nor to the life of most people I work with. And I think this is because of the process you put in place. So if I understood correctly, and to jump on the point of the international youth think tank, and it was mainly some people in a room discussing what the issues with democracies were, the focus you want to put on it, and then asking very specific input on the different points you discussed. However, this cannot lead to very relevant proposals when it comes to democracy as a whole. And that's for three things. One, the, the definitions you gave of democracy are not widely accepted. That's not how I see democracy. That's not how most people see democracy, simply you know, upholding the, law, the rule of law and human rights. It's much wider than this. Then the assumptions you made about what needs to happen are not widely shared either, I think. You mentioned realism. I don't believe we need realism in democracy. I think we need very strong idealism to not shift a bit the needle. We're very much past this stage, but to create an entire revolution when you see far-right movements taking over Europe and the world, we don't need a little shift in Italy. We need much more. And as a result, the proposals that you made don't represent what people actually want or need. Just to say, it, I love citizens' assemblies. I think a lot of those proposals are relevant, but they are not the fundamental issues we face. You don't actually talk to what we need. And for this, you need to redesign the whole process. I think you need to start by asking people what their issues with democracies are in the first place. My issue with democracy is the fact that it's extremely hard to access politics, not because of party structures, but because you have huge barriers to democracy. In France, to run for elections, you need a whole lot of money that mainly comes from you and a few people, and then you need to be able to print ballots, it's extremely expensive, etc. Those are the issues in order to be able to access democracy. You talked about voting, who has the right to vote in the first place? You talked about misinformation, how do we get access to information? It's great to labor, but who, who has this access? Do you need access to internet and so on? So I think there's a lot of good work that has been done, but it needs to be very much refocused in order to be relevant for the people. And for this, I would suggest to be a bit constructive, <laughs> to actually take it and stress test it for real. And this means asking people, okay, look, we've done this, those are relevant proposals, people have discussed them, there's validity to them. What are the key missing points? 
what are the stress moments in your life and when it comes to democracy that you would like to input on and then we can complement with our proposals. But I think unless you let people identify issues themselves, it's impossible to come up with real solutions to their democratic problems. Thank you, Colomb, and uh, take Thank you, Colomb, a... sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, going to, oh, good. Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to, everybody to know that Colomb has just been appointed on the board of the Democracy <laughs> and Culture Foundation. So this is the kind of stuff that we'll be talking about in the think part that I mentioned earlier today. That's it. That's one of the things I was going to say, so I'm glad that you did. Um, and also just that we are, we are taking this into account that that is the next step that we want to go to is sort of the process itself, looking at the process, but also taking it to the citizens um, and to a much wider community to comment on on the process. But, um, but uh, Luca has something. Yeah, I would like to ask our rapporteurs yeah, here so if they want to respond to, to Colomb, because she has made a very valid point. Yeah. It is something that, we, as Achille said implicitly and uh, Kim explicitly, we're already aware of this. Eh? So I would like to have your opinions as well. And I know there is a gentleman over here who is also going to just give the rapporteurs a moment and then I'll, I'll come get back to you. Okay? Tony? Tony? Would you like to I mean, I'd like to respond to a couple of the points, but starting here, th thank you very much for that feedback. And if I'm hearing what you're saying, we've actually done this in the wrong direction, right? That we should have started with we need to start talking to people about what it is they care about and then move forward from that basis. And I, I, I accept that entirely. Um, as we go through each of these processes, each of these phases, we keep hearing, here's how we would course correct, right? Or maybe we scrap it all together and start from the beginning. And I keep going back, you know, I, I was focusing on the power of information. We talked about disinformation. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out what can possibly be done in this space? You know, Amir made reference to this already, that you've got people who don't care. If it's labeled misinformation or disinformation, they're going to believe what they're going to believe, and they're satisfied with that. There were some comments from the youth hackers over there about this being a top-down approach, about the bubble. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, and I don't want to throw it back on you, because I'm, I'm reporting from a group, so I'm, I hope it doesn't sound defensive. I'm just trying to get a sense from you all like, when the rubber hits the road, I don't know if that's a, an adage that translates very well, but when we're talking about the real practicalities of it, what can we do? And I, I'd like to hear from you because I think your point is correct. If we're not talking to the people who are impacted by this every day, we're not going to get anywhere. But I'm curious, when it comes to the practicalities of it, whether it's engaging with people in wherever they happen to be, I think the, the suggestion was made that they need time and space, how do we gather people so that we get you know, the things that they care about, be able to boil it down so that we can have a, a, an adequate discussion. I'm just curious, starting with you maybe, what, what you think is a, is a practical approach? No, please, if you'd like to begin, and then I'd like to hear from them as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm really not an expert on misinformation, but talking to people, the first thing I would say is, again, access to information in the first place. So it's not labeling, but it's having access to reliable sources of information, which means freedom of the press, but also well-funded um, and trusted media sources, which is not the case in a lot of countries. You don't have independent, non-partisan uh, media sources to be able to trust in the first place. So you don't know if what you're hearing is simply you know, a very radical vision of the world or a very conservative one. So for me, when you talk about information, that would be one of the first things I've heard from people. And on social media disinformation, I'm not the expert, I trust that you are much more on labeling and so on. I'm just mentioning that if you talk about this, you need to understand that people have many steps before getting to the labeling part. And, and I've heard about education before, I couldn't agree more. If you don't start with education, critical thinking and so on as well, there's no chance of actually being able to understand what's happening online. And just on the point of education, which may connect to the table behind you, you know, one of the issues that, that we keep seeing and we keep talking about, and maybe you have a different experience, is that at least in the United States, the problem with education when it comes to digital literacy isn't among the youth. It's people my mother's age who vote. They go out every election, they vote, and they're misinformed, and they don't have the digital skills 
to cope. So I'm curious if that factored into your thinking also back there when you mentioned the educational piece. Okay. Uh, just to reply to your question about the space and time, just thinking from the top of my head, this is the Athens Democracy Forum, and I truly believe this could be a space to hear what the people think. And there's very few people from Athens here. Uh, I'm just imagining how this could happen, that this forum is taken outside, and we let people come. Um, and just imagining in my mind, seeing everyday people, everyday Athenians, sitting at these tables and telling you what they think they need. Um, so this was just from the top of my head. And th that this could be the space where we start hearing the people. And um, uh, we don't make proposals that are made in experts land, but in actual people's land. And coming back to education, we were asked this question during the break, and I think, of course, schools is the play, the schools are the place where you need to start digitalizing uh, kids, even from a very young age, because every kid has a phone nowadays, and it would be very easy to start from primary schools, letting them understand what is true or fake information. Uh, coming back to your mother's generation, which is also my mother's generation, yeah, they vote and they normally lack the critical thinking that we all have in this room. That was a and I'll take that, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult question, uh, in a way. And that would probably entail using schools as education, not only for kids, but for adults as well, and long life learning and all these things that we've heard before, but that we really need to stress that education should not end at my age. Thank you. Um, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Jarosław Kujsz, the Liberal Culture Foundation. Uh, to be re represented or not to be? <laughs> that is the question today. I think that uh, it is fascinating to see that we started with the panel uh, that is supposed, that is uh, a practical one, but in fact it uh, makes me think that it also reveals how theoretical it is. Because in fact, what we are discovering all over the world is the pre-assumptions of democracy. And some of the pre-assumptions, we, we were talking a lot about uh, fake news and disinformation. The point is that we are talking about the freedom of speech. And one of the pre-assumptions uh, that were in place, and perhaps we were not aware of it, well, was a presumption that it is for a group of active citizens, not for all the people that could have a voice. And now, the framing, the, 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 the circumstances are different. Everyone have a voice. And, and it means that in this respect, the challenge is the framing of democracy and understanding of democracy in these new circumstances. We are discovering our own presumptions. Uh, that, in fact, are dating ba back to the, to, to, to the ancient times and, of course, uh, in, uh, perhaps after the, the, the French Revolution. It's all to, just to, to, to ask the, the, the last question, perhaps, should be, yes, but we are talking about democracy and the whole vocab vocabulary of democracy, but our language has been hijacked in many parts of Europe. And this is a huge challenge, because uh, when, we are, when we are having uh, a country that is at war, and they are saying, we are a peaceful nation, when we have a politician that is saying, uh, that is Ill purely illiberal, and he's saying, we are true Democrats. This is quite a, a, a challenge that is a kind of a false compliment to us, but at the same time, it's a huge task, and. That would be a question for you, how to cope with it as practical pra practitioners. How would you cope with it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can take one last short question, very short question. The lady there with the hand up. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. I'm going to make a short comment instead of a short question, and um, you can respond however way you like. 
Um, so Ms. Cohn mentioned what the youth consider is the only way to approach this issue. We must get down to the roots of the issue, which is transparency and lack of engagement. Um, such the inability to be involved in political decision making. To go back to an earlier point made by the reflection group, I believe that we can add incentives for voting instead of making it obligatory because then that removes the democratic um, aspect of it by making it obligatory. And obviously there is already the incentive of having the opportunity of choosing the representative that you most closely, um, that most closely follows your belief when, it, when you're voting. However, citizens and youth specifically, and I believe I'm speaking on behalf of everybody for this, but we do not view it in that matter because their vote, they feel like their vote does not count or because the candidates do not resonate with them. So by making it more accessible and desirable, we can increase participation rates only if transparency is present. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone wants to respond? Yeah, I'm here. I think I'll be answering uh, a few of the last comments uh, altogether by saying that this is a sort of a, a, an academic approach of roundtables and trying to fix certain problems that will help us maintain resilience of democracy. I, I do think, um, like the both of you said, that transparency and involving uh, younger generation as well as uh, the, the older generation would of course help us more. But I, I think we must not underestimate or the need for responsibility from the citizens also because we can sit here all day and discuss how to bring people in but we have to realize that not everybody wants to be a part of this conversation. And even though um, social networks give everyone a voice, at least in countries that they're still available, then still somehow or sometimes that voice is limited to what they want to talk about. They want to talk about their child's schools or they want to talk about the taxes they're paying or they want to talk about transportation. That doesn't mean they want to be a part of the whole conversation. So as Democrats and liberals, I also think it should not be ob obligatory because people should want to take part in this democratic process. We have to, as a society, try to make it available for everyone and entice people to take part in it. But I think we'll be doing us um, a bad service if we think we fail just because not everybody wants to be a part of a process. So we must remember that sometimes people are okay with being by the process or next to the process and not necessarily a part of it. Thank you very much, Shamir. I think that will now be, <coughs> excuse me, bring this to a close. Um, one very short comment. Um, I think that this business about whether, where you start the process is a little bit of a red herring. Um, in, uh, in the foundation, uh, we think that um, it's a circular process a continuous circular process. You bring in the experts, they express their opinion, you stress test, you take this down to the grassroots, you hear what the grassroots have to say, it may be completely different from what you've said, take it back again. And uh, this is the way that we approach things. Uh, one announcement, we'll have a, um, a buffet lunch right outside now, and we will convene uh, for the next uh, session, which uh, is uh, on a charter for business, and where we will, have, uh, we will discuss uh, very specific proposals about how the business community should change in order to help uh, democracy become more resilient. Because this is an issue that has not been discussed uh, and has not been approached uh, in uh, most of the discussions. I wish to thank all of you for being an excellent audience, for participating. I want to thank the rapporteurs who have done a lot of work uh, uh, for several months now. What you see today is the work for a lot of people for over a year. Um, and I would like to thank you all for being an excellent audience. Have a nice lunch and see you in a little while. <laughs>